I want to welcome everybody to our workshop this afternoon. I'm Dr. Michael Taggart with the Kirkland Health Institute, and I'm a member of the National Foundation of Wellness Professionals, which is a group of doctors who go out in the community and share important information on health and wellness and disease prevention. The lecture that I'm going to be presenti presenting today is on female hormone balancing. I'm a doctor of chiropractic with over 25 years experience. In addition to that training, I'm also trained in functional medicine and also in functional neurology. Now, any doctor, regardless of the degrees behind their name, only 1% has that training. How many have heard of the term functional medicine before? Okay, some of you heard of it, maybe some of you heard it, but you don't know what it is. So let's talk about what functional medicine is. Functional medicine is the kind of the understanding that the whole body all works together. Traditional medicine has divided the parts of the body up, but they all work together, don't they, right? Everything is connected. So the understanding of the holistic nature of the whole body, how it all works together, and looking deep enough to actually what is causing the health condition and addressing the cause, and we do that, miracles can happen. We're going to show some videos here later. We might have a patient who wants to share her wins that she's had uh, in her office. We're also going to be talking a lot about uh, functional endocrinology, how all the glands and the organs, how they all work together. Um, and functional medicine is different than traditional medicine. And traditional medicine often looks at the different body parts and doesn't integrate the, the whole body together. And often what happens is, is that they basically give you something to manage your symptoms, like a medication. We're going to manage, here's how we manage your problem, but they don't have the understanding and don't look deeply enough to actually find out what is causing your condition, right? And traditional medicine is great for like acute conditions, you need an antibiotic, you need to sew you up, you had a trauma, it's fantastic for that. However, for chronic conditions, it doesn't really get very good results. And if that was, if they got awesome results with chronic conditions, then nobody would be here today, right? Okay, so the focus of my practice is reversing chronic health conditions. And I'm very good at doing that because I combine neurological testing and therapy and metabolic laboratory testing to again look at the root cause of the condition. There's a website that I want to draw your attention to called lifechangingcare.com. It's a great website. There's a, a great video that talks about more the type of care that we provide in our office and what's possible for people to have their body work better and to heal. There are over 2,000 testimonials on that website and more added every day of people, perhaps just like yourself, who were struggling with their health, were going from doctor to doctor, weren't seeing results. A lot of my testimonials are on that website, so it's something uh, that's really good. I would highly recommend that you go to that website as well. I'm also the author of this book called Healing Your Thyroid Disorder Naturally and the Frustration and Learn What Your Doctor Doesn't Know. It's available on Amazon. There's actually some copies in the back here that you can look at. If you have a thyroid problem, it's a great book to help you learn what's wrong and what you can do. They're also selling for $10 up at the register if you're interested. All right, now what we're going to do next is we're going to go over what's called the hormone stress survey. Hopefully you've already filled this out. We're going to go over some symptoms that are related to hormone issues or ultimately cause hormone problems. All right. Now, here's the thing. What does all this mean? How many of you, Ray, marked more than one box on the survey? More than one. Okay, so what does that mean? What it means is that there's, there's some problems going on. There's, there's something that's not working right in the body. There's no such thing as a normal symptom. Now, here's the strange thing. You should actually be grateful that you have these symptoms. So that's going to sound kind of backwards, doesn't it? But you should actually be grateful. Here's why that's true. You ever heard a story like this? You ever hear about Joe? He was healthy as a horse, worked out three times a week, and he died of a heart attack on the racquetball court. We've heard stories like that. But here's the thing. Was Joe really healthy? There's no such thing as a normal heart attack, right? So something was going wrong with his heart. Sometimes our body does not give us a message that something is wrong. Isn't that true? So the fact that your body is giving you a message that something is wrong even though you don't like it, you should actually be thankful because this is the way of the body telling you something's wrong. Like on your car, when the engine warning light goes on, nobody likes that, but what if that light never went on and you kept driving? What would happen? 
nothing good, right? Nothing good, okay? Now, so it's good you're having these because it's the body's way of telling you that something's wrong. Now, here's the thing. Looking, if you have a symptom or a health condition, it's never a good idea to not investigate why it's causing it and just take medication because that never works. It never works. Now, here's why that's true. Let's all imagine here, this is kind of a gray, kind of cloudy, rainy day. Let's all imagine that we're with our significant other or best friend and we're halfway to Hawaii. Okay, doesn't that sound good? We can't wait to get out there on the sand and feel the tropical rays hitting our body. Halfway there, the pilot comes on the, the intercom and says, attention passengers, the co-pilot has just informed me that the engine warning light has gone on. We don't know what's wrong, but the co-pilot is going to disable the warning sensor. So don't worry, everything is gonna be fine. Just sit back and relax and enjoy your flight. How, how, how relaxed are you right now, if that's you? I'd be in a panic, okay? So, not just taking medication and never figuring out what's wrong is never gonna work. You cannot medicate yourself out of a chronic condition. It doesn't work. Okay. Now, I don't blame you for sometimes not wanting to get things checked out because your experience with traditional medicine is, is you have a, you may have many different issues that are going on with you, and they basically spend 10 minutes with you, and what, they, what do they do? They write you a what? Right, and if that doesn't work, you go back, then what do they do again? Different. Different prescription. You end up on multiple medications, and we know inherently that there may be some drugs that are necessary, but the more and more that you're on medication, more medication, are you getting healthier or are you getting sicker? What's the answer? You're getting sicker, right? You're getting sicker. So, however, you should do something. Now, let's imagine that the state of Washington has a new program. When you're 18 years old, as long as you're shown that you can be a competent driver and that you're responsible, the state of Washington is going to give you a car. Okay? Now, if you're 18, you're going to be pretty stoked about that, right? However, here's the catch. You can't ever trade that car in and you can't ever get a new one. But they would pay for that car 100%. It would be a nice car. Now, if that was you and you're 18, how well are you going to take care of that car? How well are you going to take care of it? You're going to be checking the oil like every week, checking the air pressure, because you, if you don't take care of that car, you're going to be riding the bus. So here's the analogy. This body that you have, you're not going to get another one. So in large part, you're Happiness, your well-being, your productivity is very much connected to your health and well-being. So, basically, we got two options. One is take this information, and I think you're really going to enjoy it, but don't do anything about it. Unfortunately, nothing's going to change. Unless the cause addressed, you're going to get worse. A better option, if this information speaks to you, if it makes sense to you, then do something. Do something about it. You'll be really happy that you did. Now, if I could show you a system that would be all-natural, it would be very effective. It could actually change your life and would be affordable. How many people would want to know more about it? Raise your hand. All right, very good. Thanks for being here. I'm excited to share this information with you today. So we're going to talk about how to evaluate and restore natural female hormone balance. There's a couple different books that if you want more information, these are some books that I recommend. Uh, they're very good to learn more. So let's talk about a hormone. We've all, we've all heard the hormone, but what is a hormone? A hormone is a chemical messenger that basically creates communication from one cell to the other. The nervous system, your endocrine system, which is your glandular system, and your immune system all communicate through hormones and also through nerve signals. So it's really important to understand is that when we think of the hormonal system, it's not just your thyroid, your pituitary, your adrenal gland, and your uterus and ovaries. Your whole body communicates through hormones. Your brain communicates through hormones. So hormones are extremely important. Some of the hormones that we're going to be talking about today, we're going to talk about estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Now, both men and women have all those hormones. They're different, just in different ratios. And with the different ratios, totally different physiology, right? Men and women are similar in many ways, but we're also very different, too. 
We're going to talk about thyroid hormone, insulin, cortisol, and DHEA. Now, over 33 million Americans suffer from a chronic illness. 99% of government health care budget is to treat illness after it occurs. After it occurs, it's more expensive, even though there's been proof that the majority of chronic illnesses can be prevented. Okay, well, why is that? Well, it's because that's where the dollars are. The dollars are in treatment and not in prevention, although prevention is much better. Now, our health care system is based on in the insurance model, and it's also pharmaceutically driven. So here's what that means. If you see a traditional doctor, typically going to be a medical doctor, and most all medical doctors all take insurance. And so what happens is, based on the codes that they can write down on their billing statement, the insurance company reads the codes and it gives them X amount of dollars for that service that they provide for you. Now here's the problem. With the overhead paying staff and having some take-home money, they have to limit the time that they can spend with you. So you have chronic conditions, you're going to get about 10 minutes. Maybe 15 minutes if you're, if you're really lucky. Because that model doesn't allow a person, even if they knew what to do, to spend an amount of time with you. So the good news about that is that our fee system allows me to actually spend the amount of time that's necessary to actually get you well. Unfortunately, again, there's no, not, no money to be made in prevention. Um, and again, our system is pharmaceutically driven. So again, we talked about prescriptions. Now, what's interesting about insurance is that it will pay for as many drugs as your doctor gives. You could be on 50 drugs, 70 drugs. It would pay for all of it. Unfortunately, it oftentimes won't pay for things you really need to get well, unfortunately. So what does this mean to you? What it means is, is that if you want quality care, if you want life-changing care, you're going to have to pay for it out of your pocket. There's going to be some out-of-pocket expense. Insurance will contribute, but it's going to be some out-of-pocket expense. You just can't get world health world-class health care without doing that. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about the normal female menstrual cycle. So um, if you're menstruating, um, you experience this on a monthly basis. So when the, when the menstrual cycle is over, what happened is progesterone has declined because you didn't get pregnant. And then a few days later, what will happen, because the progesterone has gone really low and estrogen is also low, your pituitary gland is going to sense the change in your bloodstream, and it's going to say, okay, it's time for us to stimulate the ovaries so that we start building up with estrogen. And if you look on the schematic here, you should be able to see that. Okay, so right here. Okay, so period's over here, menstruation's over. So here's what's happening. This two pituitary stimulating, and what it's doing is it's, over a period of days, it's raising up the estrogen. When that estrogen gets to a peak, what happens is that the follicle in the ovary is expelled and the egg basically travels down the fallopian tube and into the uterine wall. And as that, that spike in estrogen occurs, what happens is, is that the pituitary stimulates what's called with luteinizing hormone to have your progesterone start coming up. You need progesterone to basically... Um, if you do get pregnant, you've got to have progesterone to keep the embryo viable. And then what happens after you don't become pregnant, and then what happens, estrogen keeps going up, and then what it does, it starts to, you didn't get pregnant, so it starts going down. So that's the, the cycle, and it's around 28 days, and that's what happens if, if, you're, if you're menstruating. So estrogen progesterone levels fluctuate throughout the month. So if there's different levels at different times, how are we going to figure out when the imbalance is? Well, the good news, mostly based on a person's symptoms, we have a pretty good idea what's happening. Occasionally, we have to do some testing over a 28-day period where we basically take saliva samples every three days, and that'll give us an idea of what's not going right. We usually rarely ever have to do that, but that's something that we occasionally do. So on a saliva test, we're checking free-floating hormones. Those are the hormones that actually do something to your cells. There's a lot of hormones that float around bound to a binding globulin. They're inactive. They don't do anything. So we use um, saliva testing and also serum testing. Serum means blood testing. When we take that blood draw on that certain day, it's basically a moment in time in your cycle. It's a moment in time. So 
There's no perfect test to look at your hormones. If we do saliva, serum, we may do both. So here's some symptoms of female hormone imbalance, and there's a lot of them. Overweight. You're tired, depressed. You may have chocolate cravings, which can be related to dopamine, lack of dopamine, which is a feel-good hormone that your brain needs to feel positive and motivated. You could end up with food addiction, compulsive overeating. You may have sugar cravings or bread cravings, carbohydrates. You may have low sex drive. You may cry easily. You have mood swings. You may have PMS, hot flashes. You may have um, irritability, insomnia, night sweats. You may have um, bloating. And you may even gain weight or can't lose any weight despite low calorie diet and like tremendous amount of exercise. You may find that you feel like you need alcohol to relax due to cramping. You have uh, irrational thoughts, the, what they call the axe and the husband's head syndrome. You want to kill your spouse. <laughs> okay. Um, you may have issues where you wake up between 2 to 4 a.m. You could have dry skin, hair loss, poor bladder control, gas. You may have weak bones, osteoporosis. You may retain water. You could be susceptible to brain cancer, heart disease. You may be infertile, can't conceive. You may have irregular cycles, and you may have poor reactions. To, you may have brain fog. So that's a lot of stuff. Can you imagine if anybody had all these symptoms? That would be a nightmare, wouldn't it? But a lot of women have quite a few of them, unfortunately. So some key points here. It's important to understand is that hormone balance just doesn't happen for no reason. There's always a reason why it's happening. So what we have to do is we have to look at the big picture and look for the underlying stressors of why this is happening. So we're going to talk about a few of those, and we'll, we'll, I'll keep reinforcing that. Now, you could have an adrenal gland problem. Your adrenals are on the back of the kidneys, and they make two important hormones. They actually make more than that, but the two ones that we'll talk about the most are DHE and cortisol. You also could have issues with blood sugar. When your blood sugar is all over the place, it's, when your blood sugar is high, it's inflammatory. Key, key concept, your body hates inflammation. It totally ruins your endocrine balance when you have inflammation in your body. You may have issues where you have an autoimmune disease. You could have food sensitivities, which affects your gut and creates inflammation. You could have some hidden infections. You might have heavy metal toxicity. You might be anemic where you aren't getting enough oxygen because your red blood cell count is so low. You're not getting enough um, oxygen to your cells. You could have poor gut function. The liver... The liver recycles hormones, and also your gut pays a big part in your hormonal balance, too. Most people don't know that. Now, do you have any of these issues? You don't know. Maybe, you've been, maybe, you, know, maybe you already know you have some of these issues, or maybe you don't. So we've got to do proper testing. We may do we got to do comprehensive blood work, look at all the markers that you need. We also might do some saliva testing, food sensitivity testing, we also do an, a test in the office it's called the BTM. It's an amazing test, and what it does, it checks about 32 different things that traditional blood tests don't check for, or if you did check it through blood, it would be like outrageously expensive. And that test we do in the office, urine saliva test is only $75, amazing test. It can tell us all kinds of things about your body. So have you had any of these tests? Raise your hand if you've had any of these tests. You had one or two of them? Okay. And maybe you've been told your tests are normal. Raise your hand if you've been to a doctor and said, everything is normal, but you feel terrible. This happens constantly. Okay, I get this like every day in my office. So a person comes in, they've got six, seven, ten things wrong. And I said, okay, what did the doctor do? Well, they did a blood test. What did it say? They said everything was normal. Well, for you to feel that bad, it's impossible for everything to be normal. Here's why they're saying it's normal. They didn't test enough to really find out what's wrong. And the second thing, the lab ranges that they use are way too broad because they use everybody who went to the lab last year, people that were like dying, had cancer, and a few healthy people, and they basically just average it out, and it creates a bell curve. So what happens is, is that if you're like really, really sick, it'll show abnormally high or low, but what if you're on the borderline where you're, you're physiologically not functioning it yet, you're functioning poorly, but you're not at the disease state yet. They're going to miss it. So this is a big, big, important issue. So here's how this would work out in my office. 
let's say a woman comes into my office and they have like five thyroid symptoms. They have fatigue, can't lose any weight even on a low-calorie diet, there's hair loss, they are fatigued, and maybe they also have uh, dry skin. Those are some like big red flags for thyroid. So doctor orders a few, few tests, and they, one of the things they check is TSH, which is not near enough. You've got to check more than that. They check TSH, and it comes back as a 4.2. You see that up there on the screen, 4.2. So based on the traditional range, it's, it should be, they're saying it should be 0.3 to 5.7. So this woman has every thyroid symptom normal. So they go away totally frustrated. However, if we look at the functional range, the functional range should be about 1.8 to 3.0. So this person showed up at 4.2. So this person is subclinical hypothyroid, and this is being missed over and over and over again. So that's why it's important that we use what's called the functional range, which is data from healthy people. Shouldn't we use healthy people as the data, what we want to shoot for? Not people that are like barely surviving. We want to, we got to use data that, from healthy people to know where we need to be. Now, the proper amount of estrogen or progesterone is going to vary based on your body type. If you're tall and slender, you're not going to need as much hormone. If you have bigger bones, more round, you're going to need more hormone. Now, several different things can go wrong in the female hormone cycle as far as the rhythm. So you might not be producing enough estrogen or progesterone at the right time. That's an amplitude problem. Or maybe it's too low. Now, typically it can be too low often with menopause because you're going to have less hormones, but it could be too low. Also, you might have a timing problem. These things are supposed to happen. About day 15, you're supposed to ovulate, and about day you know, 28 or so, your period's supposed to be over. But what happens is, is that the, the timing is wrong, so those are issues that need to be looked into. Now, we talked about the adrenal gland. How many people have heard of the adrenal gland? Heard it before? Okay. Do you know where it is? Right on top of the kidneys. And what it does is it makes quite a few hormones, but the ones that we're going to concern ourselves with today is it makes cortisol. Cortisol is something that's a stimulatory hormone. You need it for your brain. Basically, all your cells, your whole hormonal system needs cortisol. But if it gets too high, it's a problem. Or if it's too low, about 50% of hormone female hormone issues could be greatly improved just by correcting the adrenal gland function because your adrenal gland makes cortisol and DHEA. DHEA becomes testosterone and estrogen. So even though your ovaries and uterus make those hormones, your adrenal gland does too. So especially when you're menopausal, you have to have a healthy adrenal, adrenal gland to get through the change of life properly. If you do, you're going to go through that. If your adrenal glands are down, which unfortunately in our stressed out society, most people's adrenals are teetering and some are really not doing good, you're going to have a big time problem with menopause if your adrenal gland is not doing well. So uh, the adrenal gland is something that we, there's some tests that we do and a lot of people show trouble with the adrenal gland. It's not that it's a disease, but it's just not putting out the output that it's needed to help balance your hormones and for you to have energy. Now, progesterone levels are often affected to a greater extent than estrogen levels by adrenal gland exhaustion, creating a state of estrogen dominance, even in women with low estrogen. How many people have heard of what we call estrogen dominance? You've heard that term before? So here's what can happen. With estrogen dominance, you could have estrogen that's too high. So if the level's too high, there's too much estrogen, estrogen dominance. But you could also have an issue where your estrogen is relatively low, but the ratio between estrogen and progesterone is off, creating a relative dominance. So as far as saliva testing, your estrogen should be at a 25 to 1 ratio with your estrogen. So in this next slide, what we see is in this, it's only a 12 to 1. So that's a relative estrogen dominance, even though estrogen is not high. Now, what does estrogen dominance do? Well, let's talk about progesterone, then we'll get to est estrogen dominance. Here's symptoms of progesterone deficiency. Anxiety, irregular menses, hair loss, cramping, acne, low sex drive, mood swings, depression, excessive bleeding. 
the symptoms of excess estrogen are similar to low progesterone because estrogen is too high, estrogen dominance. If the ratio is off, estrogen dominance, but what if your progesterone is really low, then that's estrogen dominance too because we've got to have that 25 to 1 ratio. So breast swelling and tenderness, fibrotic breasts, water retention, craving uh, for sweets, uterine fibroids, fibroids, cystic ovaries, anxiety, nervousness. You can have irregular menses, low sex drive, fatigue, weight gain, PMS, low thyroid symptoms. Your thyroid needs estrogen and progesterone to function. You can get headaches. You may have elevated triglycerides. So what are the solutions to estrogen dominance or progesterone deficiency? Well, sometimes we can recommend a bioidentical progesterone. Sometimes we do that. Oftentimes people don't need that. Oftentimes there's herbal things that we can do to get your body to make more of its own progesterone. Herbs are much safer and natural bioidentical hormones are safe, but we always tend to start with herbal things because they work most of the time. Now, if you have estrogen dominance, you may just have too much estrogen floating around your body and we might give you a product to help you bind up that extra estrogen to get it out of your body and we also would typically also work on the liver. Why do we work on the liver? Because the liver cleanses, it recycles your hormones and it cleanses your gut. So we got to work on the gut for many reasons and we also got to work on the liver. I would say liver is one of the most common things that people need help for. It has like 800 functions, very important. So we also have to avoid what are called xenoestrogens. Basically these are things that actually mimic the effect of estrogen but they're not really an estrogen. Plastic creates xenoestrogen. So if you use a lot of plastic, drink out of a plastic water bottle, water can actually leach some of those chemicals out and what those chemicals will do is they'll move around in your body and they will give, um, they will have an estrogen-like effect but not in a good way. So there's things that um, you can have in your environment that will actually upset your estrogen balance based on toxins. So we've got to, again, we've got to address the underlying metabolic problems. It's common, it's, not, it's uncommon to just support a hormone. Like a person comes in and says, okay, we well, just need this. That's usually not going to work. We've got to look at the big picture because everything is connected. So giving a hormone without looking deeper can cause additional health issues. So all these things that we talked about, we've got to look at all these things, inflammation. I didn't talk too much about essential fatty acids, but essential fatty acids, which can come from uh, nuts, oils, and especially fish oil, you need to have a proper ratio there. And what happens is, is that essential fatty acids form a layer around every cell in your body has a layer of fat around it from essential fatty acids. It's got to, you can only get it through your diet. Your body doesn't make it. So you've got to have that healthy layer around every cell. And also, essential fatty acids make something called prostaglandins. And prostaglandins have a hormone-like effect. So lots of times we have women that come in with premenstrual syndrome, giving them essential fatty acids a couple days before the pregnancy. And they should probably be on them because they're deficient. But giving a lot of extra a couple days before, that can do amazing things for you know, premenstrual syndrome. So let's talk about estrogen deficiency or erratic estrogen project production. Okay, you can have hot flashes, night sweats, mental fogginess, insomnia, heart palpitations, yeast infections, depression, bone loss, dry skin, sex might be painful, low sex drive, you may have vaginal dryness, you have memory lapse, and you might be incontinent. Your bladder needs hormone to function. If it doesn't get it, it becomes incontinent. So let's talk about where some of these hormones come from. Your progesterone is going to come from your ovaries and also the placenta, also what's called the corpus luteum, which when that follicle erupts, the egg goes down the fallopian tube and something called the corpus luteum also will embed into the, um, the uterine lining and it basically creates progesterone. It stops making progesterone if you don't get pregnant. So here's one of the benefits to being a mom. The more time you get pregnant, even if you don't carry a child to term, the more the easier it's going to be for you to get through menopause. And it's also protective against cancer. So there's an extra benefit to having kids. That's good. It's hard for, you know, my wife's had a couple kids. Having kids is a joy, but it, hey, it's not easy. But that's as a benefit. The more you're pregnant, the better you're going to go through menopause. That's a, that's a nice little benefit. 
So what does, that, what does progesterone do? One of the things it does is it helps relax us. You may have heard, have you ever heard of the neurotransmitter GABA? GABA, GABA, okay. It, it relaxes us, it helps us, helps our, it's basically an anti-anxiety type neurotransmitter. So it's calming, it acts as a natural antidepressant mood stabilizer, it reduces PMS symptoms, mood swings, irritability, cravings, cramping and cravings. So we definitely want progesterone to be where it needs to be. Now the top five conditions that we would see in the office that are premenstrual women would be PMS, we've talked about that, premenstrual migraines, PCOS, Has anybody heard of PCOS? PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. A lot of people haven't heard of it, but it's kind of a nasty condition, unfortunately. Some women can't get pregnant, low sex drive and fatigue. So on PMS, what happens is, is the progesterone, um, do, what happens is it doesn't, the cycle for progesterone, um, it, there's not enough progesterone when there needs to be right before the cycle and you get PMS symptoms. There's different things we can give to augment your own progesterone. Sometimes we might give um, bioidentical uh, progesterone. Calcium and magnesium are good for cramping and then the essential fatty acids, that, that's very effective as long as we're doing everything else. Premenstrual migraines, so what happens is there, you might get a migraine because there's a, there's a drop in estrogen after um, you ovulate, but it should be a gradual. If it's like a real you know, nose dive, that can, that can cause a migraine headache. Is any, I'm just curious, does anybody here or know anybody who right before their period they get a migraine headache? There's a lot, a lot of women that have this. You know people that do? Yeah, it's, it's definitely no fun. So one of the things that we want to do is we might want to boost the estrogen right about that time so that the, they don't get the headache. PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, what happens is, is that the uh, ovaries become cystic. In other words, they become inflamed and as a result of that, when you ovulate, it's very painful. People have this know, oh, the ovulation is going to come because, you know, the, the the ovary is very inflamed, it's fibrotic, and it's going to be painful when, when they ovulate. The things that cause this are going to be high blood sugar. If you're a woman and you have high blood sugar, you're going to convert estrogen and testosterone. You don't want that. And a man, it's the opposite. If a man has high blood sugar, which is kind of an epidemic in our society with diabetes and prediabetes, it's going to cause them to convert testosterone to estrogen. So there's often an estrogen and testosterone dominance, and that's an increased risk factor for cardiovascular disease, heart um, um, hypertension. The symptoms are going to be weight gain, blood sugar issues. You're going to become, you become infertile. You can have endometriosis on top. Often we'll have bouts of acne flares up, mood swings, and fatigue. Infertility. That's a, a big problem is people spend thousands and thousands of dollars on that in medical care. What we typically find in the office is that the adrenal gland is not doing well. We also find that there's a lot of overall inflammation. Again, remember I said how the, if there's inflammation, it upsets the endocrine balance. So they might have sensitivities to food, gut problems, also be to liver issues. And often those people need a general detox. They've just got a lot of uh, chemical residues and it's getting in the way of the endocrine system working. That can be uh, quite successful in helping people get pregnant. If your sex drive isn't good, it's typically it can be low progesterone, adrenal exhaustion, or hey, maybe you're just not getting along with your spouse. That could happen. Or So those are some things to look at. Um, birth control. Birth control. What does birth control do? Why don't you get pregnant when you're on birth control? What it does the birth control has estrogen and progesterone in it and it keeps the levels artificially high so the pituitary never stimulates the ovary to expel the egg and that's why you didn't get pregnant. Now when people want to come off the pill, sometimes that cycle never gets back in rhythm like it's supposed to. So one of the things that we do is we usually have people do some things to the liver because remember liver clears your hormones um, so that can be, can be quite helpful. Now this is diagram kind of shows the overall endocrine system. What we focused on so far is we focused on how the pituitary stimulates the ovaries in a woman and how it creates 
menstrual cycle activity, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. We've also talked a little bit about the adrenal gland and how the adrenals are also stimulated by the pituitary to create cortisol, aldosterone, which is your salt, salt balance, progesterone, DHEA. Also, there's another part of the adrenal gland called the medulla, which creates epinephrine and norepinephrine. Raise your hand if you've heard these terms before, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And they're a neurotransmitter too. It's very much very important for energy, especially ener mental energy. You need that. Now, so we talked about a lot of information. So here's what I'm going to do. If anybody has any questions of what we've talked about so far, and then our next step, we're going to talk about thyroid. Does anybody have any questions on anything I've talked about so far? I did such a good job that you don't have any questions. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Your so question? question? Just to please repeat. Okay. Um, with like high blood sugar. Yeah, high blood sugar. Mm -hmm. if it's, it, will it will convert, convert no, testosterone, testosterone to estrogen. Now, men yeah. have, right, it it's the opposite. Yeah, you're going to convert estrogen to, to testosterone. Now, yeah, now, men and women, we both need those hormones, right? Yeah. But what if they're in the wrong ratio? That's not good. Facial hair for women is going to be a big side effect of too much testosterone. If the testosterone is really high, it will, it will tank your sex drive. For men, men will, will ba basically get what's called um, man boobs, I guess is what you would call them. But basically, their, their breast tissue will grow, and it will also affect their sex drive. And there's other things going to affect too. Okay, good. All right, let's go on to thyroid. Okay. Oh, let's, before we get to that, let's talk about one other thing. Let's talk about perimenopausal management. Like if you're in the chain, halfway between menopause and, uh, you know, your regular menstrual cycle, your hormones are a bit of erratic. We might have to do that 28-day test to look at what's going on. And again, we've got to look at all these issues because all these issues are going to feed into your hormones, your gut, your liver, toxicity, blood sugar, your adrenal gland. Same thing with um, 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 menopause as well. Okay, let's talk about thyroid next. Okay, so some symptoms of low thyroid are similar to um, female hormone issues. So there's definitely overlap. Again, the biggest thing that I can emphasize is that the whole body works together. You've got to look at the big picture. If you don't, you're going to have, you're going to have troubles. You're not going to get results. So fatigue, depression, brain fog, constipation, cold hands, cold feet. You feel cold all over, chronic pain, hair loss, can't lose weight even on a low-calorie diet, you may have dry skin, morning headaches, swelling in the extremities. Those are all going to be low thyroid symptoms. Now high thyroid symptoms are going to be heart palpitations, anxiety, sweating, insomnia. You might have inner shaking. Also your eyes can bulge, like a bulging eye. That's called Graves' disease. Now, how many of you have some of these issues, and how is it affecting you? How is it affecting your health and happiness? Now, it's important to realize that every cell in your body needs thyroid hormone. That's how important it is. And one of the main things it does, the thyroid hormone does, it brings oxygen to your cell. So if you're not getting oxygen, could you understand why you'd be fatigued? Does that totally make sense? Very good. Okay. All right. So we're going to go back to this diagram again. Now, here's what happens with... Uh, Thyroid. So the pituitary gland stimulates your thyroid to make thyroid hormone. 97% of that thyroid hormone is going to be called T4. It's called T4 because it has four molecules of iodine. That is mostly biologically inactive. It doesn't do much. Your body only makes 3% T3. That's, the, that's what's biologically active. That's, that's the hormone that will actually get in the cell that will actually cause your metabolism to do what it's supposed to, so to make energy, to metabolize, to make new cells. So we got a big problem here. 3% is not enough to sustain life, let alone health. So the body has mechanisms that will help convert some of that T4 that's not doing anything into more T3. Here's how it does it. Through the liver and through the gut. It, co it converts more T3, so you have enough. Now, what's going to happen if we got liver congestion? Is that going to be a problem? Absolutely. What if we got gut problems, like most people with a chronic health condition have a gut problem? 
What's that going to do? It's going to be trouble, right? It's going to be problems. Now, once we have that, that T3, it's going to circulate in the bloodstream, and it's going to find the cell, it's going to bind on the cell, and it's going to cause the body to have that metabolic activity, energy, metabolism. Very important. Now, to evaluate thyroid, we've got to look at the big picture, but as far as the thyroid panel goes, here's what, this is the, what you need to have tested. TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, total T4 or free T4, and free T3. You've got to check something called T3 uptake, which is actually a liver marker as it relates to the thyroid, and you've also got to have thyroid antibodies test. Your body can make antibodies to your own thyroid. That's as far as thyroid evaluation. You've got to have the big comprehensive because we've got to look at everything else, but that's what you've got to have tested. And typically, the only thing that's tested is TSH. That's not going to get the job done. It's not, it's not thorough enough. Okay? We talked about the optimal ranges, what it should be. We talked about thyroid in that case. Now, there's some other issues that can also going to cause thyroid problems. We talked about a conversion problem. We mentioned that. So here's the test to find out how if your liver and gut are doing. You need to check something called AST, ALT, which is um, the liver, alkaline phosphatase, LDH, total protein, globulin, and then also check phosphorus. Those are some things that you need to check to see how your liver and your gut are doing. There's other tests, but these are some good ones. So again, if we're not converting enough T4 into T3, we're going to have low thyroid symptoms. We're going to be in trouble. Okay, next test. The next, what I call metabolic deal breaker that doesn't allow your thyroid to work properly is a hormone resistance. So what happens is, is you actually make too much hormone. If you make too much hormone, what happens is the cells after a while say, I'm not going to pay attention to you anymore. I'm not going to let you in. And so as a result of too much thyroid hormone, you eventually get low thyroid symptoms because none is getting in the cell. It's in the bloodstream, but it won't get in the cell. So here's one of the big things that can cause that is high blood sugar. Okay, high blood sugar is the number one health problem in America. Many, many people are, are diabetic. More, more every year. It's a national epidemic of blood sugar because we have way too much sugar in our diet. You can also have pre-diabetes, which is called insulin resistance. So if you have di diabetes or insulin resistance, what's going to happen is you actually over-convert T3. There's too much. The, so the cells say, it's too much. We're not going not to let you in, and you're going to get low thyroid symptoms. Other things that can cause hormone resistance is you may have um, high levels of inflammation uh, with um, high homocysteine. I'll talk about that in a minute. You also may have high cortisol. So cortisol is good, but if it gets too high, again, it shuts down the cells and you get low thyroid symptoms. You also may have chronic inflammation or a chronic infection, and that's going to inhibit your pituitary, so your pituitary won't make the hormone that it's supposed to make to tell your thyroid to make hormone. Now, how would you know if you have a resistance pattern? Well, you've got to check some things out. You've got to look at your T3. We already talked about that. Do you have high cortisol? Do you have high blood sugar or insulin resistance or is homocysteine high? And that's an inflammatory marker. Your free T3 should be 2.3 to 4.2. Homocysteine should be between 8 and 12. Your HbA1c, which is a measure of your blood sugar after the last six weeks, should be 4.8 to 5.7. If you're 5.89 or above, you're insulin resistant, so you get up to 6.0, you're diabetic. So you've got to check those. Doing glucose by itself is not going to be accurate because when you check glucose, it's, a, it's your blood sugar at the time of the draw. Well, it could be up or down. It's not accurate. You've got to check the HbA1c, which is last six weeks. We talked about the adrenal saliva test. This is what actually test looks like. So your cortisol is stimulatory. It should be high in the morning and low at night because it's stimulatory. So in the morning, you need to wake up and have energy. Okay? If you don't have energy, you might have low cortisol in the morning. There could be other reasons for that, too, but you might have low cortisol. So you can see on, the, on this graph here, as you can see here, see those red areas there? That's where the cortisol should be. You see that white area there? That's where it is in this patient. 
Okay? So this person has low cortisol in the morning. Probably can't get out of, it has a hard time getting out of bed. I have a patient that takes her like uh, an hour to get out of bed. She has low cortisol. Now what happens is the day goes on, cortisol starts to go down. So here's what it should be in the morning, high, and then it goes down. See that red mark there? Now in this, with this person, it's, here it's pretty good. Okay? We have pretty good function on noon, 4 p.m., but what happens at night, it elevates. And when it elevates, it's stimulatory. How are you going to get to sleep if, you're, if your body's overstimulated? It's going to be tough, right? You might have to take sleeping pills, herbs, different things. So that's, that can be a cause of not being able to get to sleep. So that's an important test. I'd say we do this test on, if anybody comes in for chronic condition, we probably do it on every single patient because it's so common. Okay, metabolic deal breaker number three. Nutritional deficiencies. To make thyroid hormone, you have to have adequate zinc, selenium, tyrosine, which is an amino acid, iron, and copper. If you're deficient in those, even if everything else is working great, you're not going to make thyroid hormone. or it won't, be, it won't be very active thyroid hormone. Now, there's no specific blood test for that. And sometimes people can be iodine deficient, but that's not as common as most people think because it only takes the amount of iodine to fit on the end of a very tiny stick pin to have your thyroid have enough iodine to make what it, what it needs. And there's iodine and salt, right? So iodine can be an issue, but it's usually not that common. Okay, metabolic gel breaker number four. Now, this is the biggest cause of why you have a chronic thyroid, and it's called, it's uh, basically an autoimmune attack of your thyroid. It's called Hashimoto's or Graves. Graves' disease is hyperthyroid. Hashimoto's is typically low thyroid, but in Hashimoto's, you can actually have what we call the roller coaster of Hashimoto's. You have hyperthyroid symptoms and then low thyroid symptoms. It's not a fun... You do not want to be on this car that does that. That's not fun. I've had some patients that have that. So what happens is the immune system is attacking the thyroid, and what will happen is that when it attacks the thyroid, the thyroid will dump a lot of hormone in the bloodstream, and then all of a sudden you get hyperthyroid symptoms, and then it will relax, and then you get low thyroid symptoms because there's no, not enough thyroid hormone. So that would be the roller coaster of Hashimoto's. Most people don't have that, so they have this, this constant bombardment of the thyroid gland by the immune system. So here's the thing, your immune system is supposed to protect you, right, against infections and things like that, but if it's attacking your own tissues, that's bad, right? Yeah, that's not good, we don't want that. It's a very serious issue, and it's the most common reason why you have a chronic low thyroid. So why did you develop an autoimmune condition? This relates to thyroid or any autoimmune condition. What happened was is that you have a genetic predisposition to it. It runs in your family, you may have other family members with similar symptoms, or somebody several generations, you, inhi you inherited one of their genes, and then, more importantly, you actually were exposed to the triggers that cause the immune system to shift and lose the ability to discriminate between your own tissues and the bad guys. This can occur from pregnancy. Many women will say, well, after my second child, that's when I developed this. You may have a chronic infection that um, you maybe never got over. You can have chronic gut inflammation, and 80% of your immune system is in your gut. So if we have bad gut, it, we, our immune system can de dysregulate and it can attack our own tissues. There could be other reasons why your immune system dis dis dysregulates as well. So what happens is your immune system is making an antibody to your thyroid, and that's causing your immune system to, again, attack your tissues. Here's what's interesting. 52% of the time, it's attacking other tissues. That's what research says. I have a patient who came into the office. She has ulcerative colitis. She has vitiligo, which is autoimmune attacking your pigmentation in your skin. Your skin, you lose pigmentation, it turns very white. Um, she also has uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and now she has type 1 diabetes as an adult. You usually have that when you're a child. She has it when she's an adult. So she has four autoimmune conditions. It's all the same mechanism. If you have an autoimmune condition, it may be attacking other tissues that you don't even know about. So if you have Hashimoto's, what to, here's what the symptom patterns typically look like. You have low thyroid symptoms, but you have not 
responded to medication. It's not working at all. Or your dose keeps going up. Your doctor is constantly changing your dose. So your TSH is high, so we're going to give you more medication. Or your TSH is low, so we're going to give you less. So it goes back and forth. Um, if you have autoimmune thyroid, the cause of the problem is the immune system. It's not really a thyroid problem at all. It's an immune problem. So if you have that, if, they're only, if you're only addressing it through medication, it's like you've got a broken leg. Instead of putting you in a cast and having your leg broken, they're giving you a crutch so that you can walk better. But it's not addressing the cause. That's very important to, to know that. So the only solution for the long-term health is we have to address your immune system. If you have been, had Hashimoto's for a long time, you may need that thyroid support long-term because you've lost a lot of tissue. If you haven't lost that much, you might be able to totally get off the, your thyroid medication. So how do I find out if I'm autoimmune? Well, there's some tests that you can run. You can have your TPO and TH, TPG um, antibodies run on a blood test. If it comes back positive, you definitely have Hashimoto's. If it comes back negative, you can still have it because there's what we call false negatives, right? You've heard of false negatives. This happens quite frequently. So even if it comes back negative, but you perfectly fit the symptom pattern, you likely have autoimmune thyroid. There are also some non-standard standard tests that we can perform that will give us, give us, in my mind, a definitive um, evaluation that, yes, you definitely have autoimmune condition. Now, if you're autoimmune, what can you do? Look, there's no drug treatment to reverse autoimmunity and Hashimoto's. However, with appropriate natural-based therapy, the immune response can be dampened. You can feel a whole lot better, and you can live a normal life. That's the good news. So what do we need to do to address autoimmunity? Well, first we have to do is we have to, uh, we have to detect and eliminate chronic infections. When you get an acute, acute infection, your body goes into like a fever and you don't feel good, right? You have a virus. But sometimes what happens, you can be exposed to a pathogen and either your immune response mounted a response to it, you maybe felt sick, but it was never enough to actually get rid of the bug. And you still have that bug in your body. After a while, the immune system basically says, well, we can't defeat this. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for any proteins that look like this um, bacteria, virus, fungal issue, and we'll say, well, we're going to attack that protein. Unfortunately, proteins look, don't look that different, especially when the immune system is all whipped up and is trying to pounce on everything. It can attack your thyroid or other tissues. We've also got to look at your gut because 80% of your immune system is in your gut. We also have to find out what you're sensitive to. If you have a bad gut, you're going to be sensitive to foods. The number one um, sensitivity, if you have Hashimoto's, is going to be gluten. Is anybody here gluten-free? Okay, that's very good, good. There can be other, other. we also find that a lot of people um, may be gluten-free, but they don't realize that they're sensitive to other things as well. You may have other issues where their adrenal glands have been run down because of the chronic stress on your, on your immune system, blood sugar issues, heavy metal toxicity. We also need to determine what side your immune system is shifted to. If your immune system shifts either way, you're going to have an attack of tissues. It should be balanced. We also have to look at what things will help rebalance your immune system. Vitamin D is critical. We live in the Northwest, and I would say it's one of the most common deficiencies, right? We don't get enough sun, so a lot of people are vitamin deficient. Vitamin D helps balance your immune system. There's other things that are necessary to help balance your immune system. We also are going to perform a neurological evaluation, too. Now, here's the thing. If you're not getting oxygen to your tissues and your brain needs 30% of all the oxygen, what would that do to the brain? Could you be brain foggy? Could you be forgetful? Maybe have trouble with concentration? So we've got to do a neurological evaluation as well to see if the brain's doing okay. If it's okay, we don't need to do anything. But often it's not because this has been going on for years and people haven't, didn't know this is going on. So we do a detailed neurological evaluation and our goal is to do things to help activate and get the brain stronger neurologically as we are addressing the autoimmune and getting the inflammation down. Now, what if you have a thyroid problem, but it's not autoimmune? Well, we still got to do all the testing to rule that out, and we're going to work on different things, your hormones. We're going to work on adrenals, blood sugar, food sensitivities, gut issues. And we're also going to do a neurological evaluation, again, because the brain needs oxygen 
the function. So many cases, regardless of why people have the symptoms, are a combination of neurological problems and metabolic problems. Now, if you, if you have a problem that seems like a, a metabolic problem, why would you need to do anything to, to address the nervous system? Now, this diagram shows that the brain, the spinal nerves, through the sympathetic nervous system, stimulate and modulate organ function. So if you have a metabolic problem and a neurologic problem, if we just work on the metabolic, you wouldn't get, the, you wouldn't improve as much as you could. So in our office, we evaluate the big picture, and that's why we get such good results. And you're going to hear about some of our results here in a minute. Okay, so there's different tests that we do to get us an idea how the brain might be involved in a health condition. So what I'd like to actually do is I'd like to demonstrate this, and what I'm doing is something called functional neurology. It's a way to evaluate and do things to improve brain function, and it has, a, it has a applications throughout any health condition. So I need a volunteer. I would like to have a volunteer. Maybe you got challenges with balance, like your balance is not so good. Maybe you got a shoulder problem too. Would anybody... Okay. Any, how about, could we, would, you like to, would you like to volunteer? Okay, great. What is your name? Saria. Saria. Okay, could you take your shoes off here for me? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. Saria. I have bad balance. Okay. That, that, that's good. You're not going to just stand up and fall over though, are you? No. Okay. All right, it's not that bad. Okay, yes. so can you come over here? With my shoes off? With your shoes off. Okay. With your shoes off. Yep. There is that. Okay. We'll give you a minute. Okay, very good. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Can you just turn and I want you to face me, okay? Very good. Okay, now just look that way if you could. Okay, now what I want you to do, can you put your feet together for me? Okay, good. Okay, good. Now what I want you to close your eyes and we're going to see what happens. And there's sway. Okay. So there's some sway. Yep, you kind, of, you kind of pitch forward. Do you feel like you're pitched forward? Mm -hmm. Can you turn your head to the left for me? Okay, so that's a bit unstable too. You feel that? Mm -hmm. Can you turn your head to the right? Okay, so you feel, the, feel how you're wobbly? Yep. Yeah, wobbly. Okay, did everybody see that? So when you close your eyes, there should be a little bit, but that was excessive. It was too much. Okay, can you have a seat right here for me? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a muscle test, and we're just going <coughs> to get the general idea of is the brain connecting through the lobes of the brain and through the neck out to the peripheral nerves to this shoulder. I'm just going to push down. You just resist my pressure. Hold strong for me. Okay, she does pretty good there. Now, how about if I come out here like this? How are we doing there? Good. Okay, out here like this, and I'm going to push straight down. Uh-oh. Hold strong. Do you see how she's just totally weak there? So there's something in her nervous system that's not connecting on this left side that's connecting on the right side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, I'm going to check some things out here and what we're going to do is we're going to do some very non-invasive things to help her balance and help her overall brain and her overall health. Okay? So hold this up for me. I'm going to push down. Okay, so he goes weak there. So here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lightly tap on an area of your neck at about the second cervical. This isn't going to bother you at all. I'm just going to go right here. That wasn't so bad, was it? <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, now we're going to keep checking here. Okay, hold this up for me. Now what, I wanna, what I'm going to do here is I want you to look at my finger. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have her, her eyes watch my finger up and to the right down to the left, and we'll do the other side. And what I'm che checking for is I'm checking can the back part of her brain, her cerebellum, can her cerebellum move the eyes like it's supposed to and maintain her muscle tone? It should be able to do that. So let's see what happens. Okay, hold this up. Now watch my finger and resist. So on the right side, she does totally okay, right? You, you maintain your strength. Did you feel that? Mm -hmm. Okay, now on this side, let's do the same thing. Hold strong. Hold strong. Hold strong. Do you feel how you just can't do it? Mm -hmm. See, so when I move her eyes on the, uh, from the right to the left, she can't do it. She just totally goes weak. So that's a part of her brain that isn't firing at the level it needs to. It's not a disease, but it's a lack of function. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some very quick, non-invasive things to help strengthen that shoulder, and it should help her balance, too. Let's see if it does. Okay, hold this up. Okay. Um, good. Should 
I look at you? No, just, you're just doing good. So let's see, I check this. So it was, let's see, let's check this again. Okay, let's go, and let's go this way again. So that's off. So it's a right cerebellum. Okay, right cerebellum. Okay, good. Okay, we're going to check some, we're going to check your frontal lobe. We're going to check your parietal lobe. Okay, hold this up. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do some vibration on her right shoulder, and she's going to do some eye exercises at the same time. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take what's called the percussion instrument, and I'm going to stimulate her right, you can drop that down, her right, um, her right shoulder, because she had a right cerebellar weakness. This vibration is going to stimulate her brain. And at the same time, I'm going to have her do some eye exercises, okay? So what I want, that, that exercise that you got weak on, where we went like this, I want you to just do that, okay? okay? So you can watch my finger. Let's see here. Good. Okay, we're just going to do this for about 30 seconds more. You can feel that, can't you? Okay, good. Hold this up for me. Okay, very good. All right, very good. Now I'm going to check a couple more things. Good. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to recheck the weak muscle. So do you remember how you weren't very good here on this mm -hmm. one? Drop down a little bit. Okay, hold strong for me. I'm doing good. Do you feel how it's better? It's like right away it gets better. Now we would, this, is, this would be a starting place for her. Obviously one treatment is not going to yeah. cure her, or, but it'll, it'll, already she'll, she'll do better. So now what we're going to do, we've established that we've been able to increase nerve and brain connection to her left shoulder. Now we're going to have her stand up and we're going to check her balance. Let's see if it does better. Okay, so feet are together. Okay, look straight ahead for me. Okay, eyes are open. Now close your eyes and let's see what happens. Not as wobbly. Not as wobbly. A lot better, actually. Mm -hmm. You feel the difference? Look, can everybody see the difference? He's like a lot better. Cool? Very cool. Oh, thanks, sir. Okay, good. So that, that's a de de um, demonstration of what we call functional neurology. Very powerful things that we do. To be healthy, you've got to have a healthy brain, right? Now, what I want to do is I want to play a couple of testimonials here, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, I'm going to play a testimonial that has to do with, uh, let's talk about somebody who had Hashimoto's. You said had. Okay, we're here with uh, one of our patients today, Marlene. And Marlene, can you share with us, um, when you came to the office, what kind of health challenges were you having? Um, I guess over time I've been having a lot of chronic issues, mostly related to my thyroid um, and anxiety and other mm -hmm. um, uh, cortisol type issues. Mm -hmm. um, what really brought me in was I had sort of a health crisis right after my surgery. I couldn't sleep. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been working the program mm -hmm. with Dr. Taggart. Yep. And, um, so here I am today, halfway through my program. Okay. And um, also there were there some issues with, I believe, with fatigue too, right? Oh, yes. You were quite, quite tired. And through the workup that we did, we, we discovered that there was an autoimmune component to what was going on. And as a result of um, what the improvements that you've had so far, um, how's, how is your sleep doing? How is your energy level doing? How do you feel like your overall brain's doing? Um, Sleep-wise, I'm sleeping better than I have in many, many years. Which that's is that's awesome. exciting. That's awesome, yeah. Yes. Don't ever underestimate mm -hmm. sleep. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that my thought processes um, are much calmer. I'm feeling a lot less anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, I'm feeling very focused and engaged. That's um, wonderful. That's wonderful. And our energy level is, of course, better too. Oh, yes. All right. And we also had some plantar fasciitis issues that have been improving with what we're doing as well. Right. 
And you shared with me about a week ago that there's another practitioner that you saw who um, you were sharing with him, you know, how things were different. And what were some of the comments that he made about, about you when he saw you again? Um, before I was, I started with your program, mm -hmm. I um, was seeing another practitioner who did mm -hmm. um, body work. Um, mm -hmm. Massage uh, and things like that. Massage yeah. and amongst other things. And we've been working together for quite a while. And after a while, I stopped um, seeing him. We just weren't getting any um, progress. And I think we were both a little frustrated with it. Um, then I went back to see him after um, starting Dr. Taggart's mm -hmm. program. Yeah. And um, he's like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. What's mm -hmm. been going on? And mm -hmm. so I started telling him that, you know, I've started this new routine. And mm -hmm. he said, well, I just have to stop you. Mm -hmm. um, you seem like a completely different person. Wow, that's really awesome. Which was kind of a shock. Mm -hmm. um, he said that I seem very... Um, mm -hmm relaxed mm -hmm. and engaged and mm -hmm. um, which was significantly and, different. And he could visibly see that you were happier. Yes. Which is a big, big thing. That's and uh, awesome. he also noticed that my my thyroid area mm -hmm. was not as inflamed and enlarged. So okay. there was physical um, mm -hmm. uh, improvement as well. That's exciting. I appreciate you sharing that with us. So, you know, with our programs where we combine what we call our brain based therapy, our neurological therapies, working with people on a metabolic basis, sometimes even working with people on a mind-body basis, and also the chiropractic care, if that's indicated. We can tre create tremendous changes for patients, and I appreciate you sharing this story with us. And if you, ha if you ran across people that were having chronic health conditions that weren't improving, would you, would you share our, our office with them as well? Absolutely. All right, thanks so okay. much, appreciate it. We're gonna do one more. Now, this patient was actually gonna come today, something happened. Okay, here I am with one of our patients, Maggie. And Maggie, you came to our office uh, several months ago, and what are some of the health challenges that you're experiencing? Well, I couldn't stand up for more than five seconds, stand up with my legs together. Mm -hmm. I had vertigo, migraines. Mm -hmm. um, I would just collapse on the floor. I had stomach problems. I had chronic pain everywhere. Um, fatigue, I didn't feel good, and it made me retire early. Okay, so as a result of these health challenges, and you had tried, and you went to conventional doctors, and what was the results of, you know? I was good. Yeah. All the blood tests mm -hmm. were good. Mm -hmm. All the heart mm -hmm. monitoring were good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the PT, I went mm -hmm. to PT, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all good. Mm -hmm. I did everything they asked me to, uh, and I still had but it. But you didn't improve? No, not at all. Yeah, so I couldn't shower mm -hmm. without worrying about falling. Mm -hmm. I couldn't walk my dog. Mm -hmm. I couldn't... Uh, it was so limiting. I had to... S instead of extending my work and mm -hmm. taking a voluntary layoff, mm -hmm. I had to retire at in December. Right, because, Early. because it just couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't manage do it things. another day. Couldn't manage things, okay. So you came into our office, we did our detailed um, evaluation, looking at your whole nervous system, spine, brain. Uh, we also did some um, sp very specific um, blood work, and we also did a urine saliva test. And we found a lot of things that the other doctors weren't finding, and so we, with our protocols, we addressed the causes of what was causing your issues, and as a result of doing our program, changing your diet, nutritional supplements, brain therapy, uh, chiropractic adjustments. What has been the result of your, um, what, tell us about your improvement. I can stand. I don't need somebody in my house when I take a shower. I'm, I can paint a house. I can climb a ladder. Yeah. <laughs> I have enough energy to do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I don't have any more chronic pains. Mm -hmm. I don't take, mm -hmm. um, Tordal. I have shots of Tordal that I mm -hmm. used to do three a week mm -hmm. when I was working because of headaches mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any of that anymore. I haven't taken a pain pill since May. Wow, that's amazing. In addition to all these all these improvements and not having to take uh, medications that don't work, you also have quite a bit of change in your weight. 
How much weight have you lost so 39 far? 39 pounds. 39 pounds. That's yep. incredible. Yep. A lot of inches too. Yeah, that's incredible. And you'll look, you'll look, you'll look great. So yeah, I was 230 great. pounds at 5'2". Yeah. yeah. When I came in. So miraculous changes, totally changed your whole life. You're able to be more active. You're actually painted a house, which that would have been impossible for you to do prior to our care. So that's really exciting. You fixed me in five seconds on the balance. You touched, yeah. uh, did a mm -hmm. tool on my spine, mm -hmm. it connected, and I was fine. Yeah, and we did some stuff on the brain too as well. That's great. And and who is it that you referred you? We want to give a shout out to your friend. Oh, yeah. Kate Olson, uh, Northwest yeah. Wellness Coach. She's a lifesaver. Thank you. She's a lifesaver for yeah, you. Yeah, she was. She referred okay. me. That's great. And um, if you knew someone, Maggie, who was having um, chronic health conditions, uh, would you recommend her office? Yes. I would love to send my whole family. All right. Okay. So let's, 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 um, any questions? Uh, do the majority of people I see have iodine deficiencies, specifically like T3, T4 hormones? Are you talking about thyroid hormones or are you talking about the nutrient iodine? Like your T T S H is too high, which too high, which, too, which 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 means low low thyroid. There's an inverse relationship between T S H and your thyroid pro hormone production. Yeah, I'm just wondering if that happens yeah. in the majority. Of I would say that it's pretty common. Not every patient comes in with that, but um, when people have a thyroid problem, it's a common for T S H to be elevated. But sometimes it'll still it'll show okay, and the, we end up finding out that they have Hashimoto's, and um, TSH, when you have Hashimoto's, that trumps everything. So we, do, we work on the immune system, and that, and that will balance out. Okay, good question. Anybody else have any questions in the back? Yeah, so this might be highly theoretical, but you mm -hmm. mentioned that uh, overconsumption of, of uh, no, overproduction of cortisol can mm -hmm. cause uh, under-conversion. Yeah, and, so, so, and also can suppress your pituitary. Yep. Got it. Yep. So, Could, right, which ultimately leads to the low thyroid symptoms because the receptors don't like high levels and so they basically stop accepting the, the thyroid stimulus hormone. So what did you say? Or two hypothesized that if you're really stressed out, uh -huh. it will lead to these sugar uh, overconsumption? Because of that T3 conversion. So, you're, if you're so you're saying, can you rephrase the question? So I totally follow you. Sugar, uh, high blood sugar? Okay, high cortisol. high cortisol. Yep. Could that then lead to sugar cravings? Sugar cravings? Um, I would say it, it could be, but lots of times when people have a cortisol problem, not in every case, they also have a blood sugar problem. Because when you have spikes of blood sugar, it stimulates your cortisol. So the blood sugar and the cortisol definitely have a kind of a back and forth relationship, but, but definitely not in every case. Not in every case. All right. There's a question somewhere up here. Right here. So, when someone has ha Hashimoto's, yeah. yeah, yeah, and they come and see you, yeah. Um, do you like just do all these tests, or I mean, mm -hmm. how, how do you start? Well, what what we do is we look at what tests you've already had. If they're recent, we don't want to we don't want to redo them because we already know that what the levels are. But then what we're going to do is we're going to add tests that haven't been done. Like one of the most common things that's not done is they don't check something called C-reactive protein, cardiac sensitive, and that's a great marker for inflammation. You know, if those medical doctors would at least do that one test, they go, okay, you've got massive inflammation. I have no idea where it's coming from, but some, you need to see somebody because something's going wrong. We see that elevated all the time. So we would we add that test. You know, we just, whatever isn't, hasn't been done, we've got to order those tests. And then mm -hmm. um, when you have it, you mm -hmm. have That's a good question. Yeah, some people, some people, some people will actually do better on synthetic. What we find out is a lot of people, um, we can augment the thyroid support with other things that, from more natural standpoint, that would also help support the thyroid. So they typically will maybe stay on their medication. But some people come in like this medication isn't working anymore. So it's like, why would you take it if it doesn't work at all? So, um, but the key thing is, is that we got to work on the immune system. 
because fiddling around with the thyroid hormone is big. Like I said, it's when you've got a broken leg and it's like, you know, instead of putting a cast on and letting the, letting the wound heal, it's just like you have, a, you have a, a cane. So now you can walk better, but you're still crippled. So we've got, and we've got to look at the immune system. The gut is 80% immune system is your gut. Here's an interesting fact. You've all heard of celiac disease, right? And people have celiac, have this inflamed gut where they can't tolerate gluten. It's like a toxin to them. About 20 to 30% of celiac people don't have any gut symptoms. Isn't that, isn't that wild? You think their gut's totally inflamed, like their, their digestion, they have no symptoms. The symptom they typically have will be neurological. They have like balance problems, they get tremors, and sometimes there aren't. It's very common for people to have gut issues, but they don't always have symptoms. A lot of times people do, but sometimes you just aren't aware of it, but it's still going on. Question in the back? Yes, yeah, so is the immune system like the main cause for uh, hyperactive thyroid? Yeah. It, it's, in other words, it's the system that gets off kilter that actually causes your body to attack itself. The reasons you get an immune system problem is you've got chronic infection that no one's tested for and gotten rid of, you have a bad gut, you got food sensitivities, you have trouble with your blood sugar, adrenal, all these things that we talked about, all these underlying issues, those are typically all going to be involved with autoimmune. And we also have to figure out where your dysregulated immune system and give you things to balance it out. Yeah. Maybe the other way around, you have like hyperactive thyroid that messes up your immune system. Is just one thing come before the other? Is it more like somatic and that they both happen? Yeah, and I said in other words, your thyroid is, is off kilter, but and it's causing your immune problems. Right. Um, I would think that would only happen if you had some kind of um, toxic exposure, like radiation to your thyroid or something like that. That would be very rare, but it could happen. So I just yeah. feel like fluoridation. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible. It's possible. I don't think that happens too much, but I think it's possible. Okay. Yeah, it's possible. Okay. Any, any other questions? All right. Great. You guys have been a great audience. Okay. So what's the next step? If you want to improve, if you want to have better health, you need to see us so we can help you. Now, my gift to everyone is to have, that's, that's interested and is you know, serious about getting better. I'm going to invite you to have a neurometabolic evaluation or office. We're going to check your metabolism. We're going to check your nervous system. And when we do that, we are going to consult with you about your health condition. We're going to review old labs. We'll make a recognition for in more lab testing. We're going to do physical and neurological examination. Normally that evaluation is $350 in my office. We basically have a special offer for its seminar only. It's $49. And we make that low so there's no financial barrier that pe person wouldn't want to investigate to find out what's wrong and to get a recommendation to, to do better. So a couple take... Do you see you or do you see someone else? Like you see me. Okay. Yeah, you see me. You talk to Janice, okay? Now, if you have insurance, insurance will contribute to the cost, but it won't pay. It's not going to pay all of it. Again, again, my fee system allows me to spend the time that I need with you to get you better, okay? You've done the medical thing, it's not work for you, we got to get out of that um, insurance only uh, mindset. So if you're truly committed and you're going to follow what I, what I recommend, it's going to be life changing for you. There's no real reason financially that you can't get care in my office because we have flexible payment options. Now here's the thing, there's only so much more time that we have in life and if you are feeling bad now, is this the way you want to feel the rest of your life? If not, our office is a great place to come to. Now, four reasons why you should accept this gift. Health problems get worse over time if not corrected, so don't wait. You'll be happier, healthier, and more productive, just like these people that came into my office. If I can help you, I'm going to let you know. If I can't, I'll tell you that too. I'll try to find another doctor who can tell you. I do not want to waste your time or your money, so there's absolutely nothing to lose because I've already spent, you already spent this time with me and I'm giving you it for $49. If you want to come in, Check the box on your survey, give it to Janice, she'll, she'll make an appointment to you. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the hormonal patterns that you have. We're going to look for undetected brain dysfunction. We're going to check toxicity, acid base balance, and much, much more. You haven't had this in-depth evaluation and testing. That's why you're not better. In order to get this special off, you've got, you've got to make an appointment today. Okay? All right. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. And, and uh, talk to Janice if you want to come in. But 
only make an appointment if you if this is really important to you and you're committed. If you're committed, I'll be able to help you. So again, thanks for coming. I'll hang out here if anybody has any um, um, questions that I can answer privately. If you're interested in one of the thyroid books, you've got to talk to Janice or you go up front. I think it's ten bucks. It's fifteen dollars online. It's ten dollars if you pay at the cash register. Thank you. Thanks for you were a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.